Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at remote viewing research. With me is Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, a theoretical and experimental physicist. She is the author of several books, including Orbiting the Moons of Pluto, Complex Solutions to the Einstein-Maxwell-Schrodinger and Dirac Equations, and also the Holographic Anthropic Multiverse. In addition, Dr. Rauscher was featured in the book by MIT professor David Kaiser called How the Hippies Saved Physics. And she's the author of a forthcoming book on remote viewing called Mind Dynamics in Space and Time, a Physicist's Perspective on the Nature and Properties of Consciousness. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I'm reminded of how uh, one of my very first experiences in remote viewing at SRI International took place with you as the outbound experimenter back in 1976. Wow. You know, it's so interesting because I approached the whole thing as what I call an open-minded skeptic, mm -hmm. very skeptical but open to the possibilities. So, you know, I went outbound mm -hmm. and uh, the... Maybe we should define what an outbound experiment okay, is. Okay, well, we'll define the roles. Yeah. The subject perceiver is someone that you, either someone that might be well known like Ingo Swann or Pat Price, but in general, they were the engineer or the secretary down the hall that I could get free for lunch to be a viewer. And in my case, a visiting graduate student. I'm a visiting graduate student. And then you have a monitor with the viewer, mm -hmm. and they help elicit, it's sort of like they're, the viewer's the right brain, and the left brain questions like, are you perceiving something? Mm -hmm. Are clues, but they have to be non-invasive. They have to not yeah. steer the v viewer because the uh, monitor may not be correct in right. what he's assessing. And in, in, and in this instance, back in 1976, the monitor was Russell Targ. Russell Targ, yes. Who is yes. the author now of many books on remote viewing and, and one of the pioneers in the field. And of, of course, he couldn't ask me any leading questions because he didn't know what the target was. Then you have a set of randomly <coughs> chosen target geographical locations, mm -hmm. basically bank building or maybe a church or a playground or, you know, just, and they're put in yeah. envelopes sealed and actually a safe. I understand uh, the target pool consisted of maybe a hundred locations right. all within a half hour drive of uh, the SRI International Facility, which is like a big college campus in Menlo Park, California. Right. And so then you take out a set of those <laughs> envelopes. So you do a series of six to eight experiments together and there's no marking on the envelopes to randomize it and you use a random number generator. When the outbound person, when I'm in the car, so then I randomly choose one of those envelopes and go to that target and mm -hmm. spend 15 minutes there. Now there is a trick to being an outbound experimenter because you really need to be there. And if you're, if you're fuming over your tax statement, you're going to get the noise in the system. You actually yeah. have to pay attention of where you are for 15 minutes. And I'll tell you a funny story about Because you're like a telepathic sender. Yes, you mm -hmm. are a sender. You're a beacon. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, a cyclone overpass, a cyclone fence. And I was with a clipboard with a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. So I'm going along feeling the cyclone fence and a, a cop comes up to me. 
He said, what are you doing? And I said, there's a psychic percipient, percipient perceiving me at SRI. <laughs> I'm sending him a message about this target. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me really funny. Yeah. And he calls to his buddy. He says, this is a 50-50, which I found out later what it meant. But I looked up against the sky, and you could see the cross wires and you drew that perfectly you drew the uh, mm -hmm. and, uh your drawings were so accurate you said there were um yellow and pink flowers all accurate and i found out later were 50 50 meant um nuts but harmless <laughs> 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 and so but uh, actually although it might appear to be nuts this was a serious scientific experiment oh, hey, it was uh, there's, uh, I mean, a lot of funding went into it and a lot of work. It's like any experiment, I don't care whether it's a physics experiment, a biology experiment, has to be very carefully done. I was in a yeah, an electromagnetically sealed room so that if you had tried to send me a message using a radio transmitter, it wouldn't have gotten through to me. Now, the other thing is there weren't cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> This but was, there was no physical direct contact in any way that I could send you a message other mm -hmm. than psychic. Yeah. And then your drawings were so accurate, and you even read my mind. I said, oh, it's an outdoor site, and I'm cold, and I forgot my sweater. And that's the first thing you had on your tape, which is the first thought I had. Yeah. I said, well, maybe there's something to this after all. Well, you know, the intriguing thing, looking back on it now, almost 40 years ago, is that, uh, and this was one of my very first remote viewing ex experiences, and, and one of the very best. I mm -hmm. mean, it, the drawings, as you say, could hardly have been more accurate, and yet, in my own mind, I didn't interpret them correctly. No, what happened was the, the way to... Uh, wire looked in the cyclone fence, it looked like you drew part of it. And mm -hmm. then you said it looked like hangers without the clothing. Yes. I, and then uh -huh. you said, which was in the distance, you could see through it, yeah. was the uh, uh, yellow and pink flowers. It was mm -hmm. a really excellent viewing. And I thought, hmm. So the more I did, the more outbound I did, I thought, geez, you know, and then... I even drew the uh, an intersection with... Yeah, where I parked <laughs> relative to the cross-section, yeah. uh, cross-over uh, mm -hmm. pass. And so it's, it's so interesting, because as I got more involved with the experiment, see, I thought, well, I'm the objective scientist, you know, I don't, I don't do this remote viewing stuff. So then later I did some experiments where I was the subject, and... They were really good, mm -hmm. you know. And I had stayed at Russell Targ's house, and he had what he called the force choice, four choice trainer, where you try to guess what the next button yeah. is oh, going yes, to be. Oh yes, that was something funded by NASA originally, so before, as I before recall. Before the the experiments mm -hmm. I did, I got perfectly a chance. Mm -hmm. Then after about five experiments that I was involved with, either outbound, monitor, or subject, I got highly statistically significant. So you choose to be psychic. Mm -hmm. You choose to use that modality, which I found very interesting. Well, Gertrude Schmeidler, one of the pioneer researchers at the City College of New York, came up with what she called the sheep and goat right. uh, effect, that people who believed they could do it scored higher. People who believed it was not possible possible scored sometimes below chance as if they were blocking. Right, <coughs> and, and that's very true. And actually what I found is there are certain people that would believe in real-time remote viewing but did believe in precognition so I wouldn't use them in those experiments mm -hmm. because they didn't believe in it. Yeah. it p not believe in it, but believe it's possible. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did because I'm skeptic about standard science as well. I mean, I look into everything very carefully. So I have my skeptic uh, 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 mask on all the mm -hmm. time. But you have to be open-minded and allow the possibility. Yeah. 
Now, at this point in your career, looking back after decades of research, you've probably done uh, more than a hundred remote viewing experiments. Right. And I did a, a several different statistical measures and as multi, multi millions of one against chance you would get those results. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's just very, with all the statistical measures, some are computer generated and some are human judging of target to uh, viewing. And uh, so, you know, it, it take me about maybe uh, uh, 100,000 years of null experiments to overcome those, so I'm not planning to mm -hmm. do that. But it's very interesting because when I first began to think, oh, this stuff is real. Yeah. Then you think, oh, I'm going to the head of Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and say, hey, guess what? And then you're fired the next day. So what I thought is... <laughs> when you were hired at, by the Stanford Research Institute. I was Institute. hired by Stanford, but I was still on loan from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, obviously I can't just say what I think to everybody. But, of course, it got around, and I will say the reaction to was sort of a, a traction repulsion. Some of the professors were curious, but then later, oh my gosh. And I thought, why is it a threat? Why would they care, you know, whether mm -hmm. Psi is real or not? Well, of course, it does have major implications about our interconnectedness and our responsibility for what we think as well as what we do. Yes. And I think they wanted to not have that. And But it's changed so drastically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has been a real revolution in thought. Yeah. Well, you are a very open person to me. And uh, back in the day, in, in the early part of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud wrote about the human unconscious. And basically, he said, we don't want to know what's in our own mind. Much less anybody else's. <laughs> Exactly. But you so know there's a what? lot of I think resistance. It's, I think it's very important because part of psi mm -hmm. is to take what you perceive. Now let me it, interrupt you though because you used the term psi and not all of our viewers will know. Psyche phenomena. So, yeah, it's a term parapsychologists use for all psychic phenomenon of which remote viewing, also known as clairvoyance, is an example. Clairaudience, uh, clairsentience. And telepathy. Right, and telepathy and precognition. Mm -hmm. But what is Im uh, important is to get in touch with your own subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And I realized the power of it. When I was in high school, there was a trick problem that I couldn't solve. It was kind of a complicated problem. So I went to bed that night and I solved it in my sleep, mm -hmm. woke up with the right answer, 650 feet, looked at the back of the book, it was the right answer. I could reconstruct the problem and I realized the unconscious is a fantastic reservoir. And when I first struck quant uh, calculus, man, my mind was dreaming about equations out the yin-yang, mm -hmm. but it was deciding where to allocate all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So part of it is getting in touch with yourself and not caring whether anybody reads your mind. If you're telling the truth, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's only people that might want to hide the truth, either from themselves or from others. And so it's really part of that Freudian idea that you need to find out what's there. And I mean, there's all kinds of, mm -hmm. of ways in which we can create, and it is really through the reservoir, one of the reservoirs, of creativity is through the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. Well, your research, as I understand it, showed not only that people can do remote viewing, but that space and time do not seem to be limiting factors. No, what it is is space time is a marker. Like we're going to meet for pizza in space and time but we can transcend it. And that is, a good example is if I had a mountain with a road going around, two cars were going around, they didn't know their future of passing each other, but from a higher helicopter perspective, I could predict their future. Mm -hmm. And so then you could predict, and uh, it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, really, um, it, it changes your life. And also, I, you know, when I got really good at it, of course, and I could read people's minds, 
But I decided, you know, it's none of my business, you know, I just, I don't need to read their minds. Mm -hmm. But when I was co-authoring a paper with a professor, um, he would ask these elaborate questions, so he'd go on and on and on, and I'd already get the point because we were communicating, so I was reading his mind, so I had the answer already, and so I could sound like I was more brilliant. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people who are very successful in their careers are, we say they're highly intuitive, but what probably is involved is that they're using psi abilities. I met a number of CEOs when I gave my lectures at different places who said they run their business by psi. That that's how they how they, they were succeeded. that explicit with you. Yeah, I were that <coughs> explicit, and I, I it was about three or four of them that came up to me after the lecture, and they were you know really uh, multimillionaires, and they said that's how they did it. Mm-hmm. Well. Uh, and of course, there have been studies. There's the classic uh, uh, ESP in business, executive ESP is the title <laughs> yes. of the book written by John Mahalski and Douglas Dean, at, uh, who did research at the Newark College of Engineering. It's now the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, and uh, they did research with business executives and mm -hmm. found that in a test of precognition, computerized tests looking into the mm -hmm. future that uh, those executives who were uh, running profitable companies showed a positive score. Those executives whose companies were losing money actually scored below chance on a test of free cognition. Well, it's very interesting because I, re I reread Napoleon Hill Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. And if you really look at that book, it's kind of a spiritual discourse mm -hmm on getting information in from all possibilities, including psychic phenomena of the future, and in organizing that into what you're doing. And yes, uh, in a way it's kind of interesting if I make a list of things that I intended to do, took a lot of work mm -hmm. to do them, but most of them came to fruition, and some better than I ever believed, like mm -hmm. some of the work on the remote viewing and the fundamental physics group, and then, you know, people, uh, I mean, I have students or young people come up to me and talk to me all the time, and it's like, it's not other or different. DSP is part of their life. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Napoleon Hill and his book, Thinking Grow Rich, because it reminded me that one of the main financiers of the research of J.B. Ryan, the pioneer right. parapsychologist who worked at Duke University and then later set up his own institute, now called the Ryan Institute, he was funded by W. Clement Stone, who was also oh. one of the leading uh, public speakers in the area of uh, Think and Grow Rich or positive thinking, as it's often called. Well, the positive, there was really uh, some of the people in the positive thinking, which was really in the 50s, Yes. Uh, really re kind of preliminary or early psi researchers in mm -hmm. their own right, but it was applied psi. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you really think about it, what if, you know, just take telepathy, or what if, you know, just awareness of other beings, mm -hmm. what would you want? You would want kindness and compassion. Mm -hmm. You would want things that make the world a better place. So I think it's applicable in education, in health, and personal well-being, mm -hmm. and actualizing positive goals. And so it should be integrated in society. And I think kind of just there's a revolution in physics going on, but I think there's going to be a revolution in medicine, I hope, mm -hmm. that's along this line, and hopefully in education, so it's not just a teacher talking to the students, but engaging the students and mm -hmm. allowing them to create and maintain their natural, useful creativity. Well, these ideas, as, as I think about it historically, Elizabeth, go back to the American 
transcendentalist movement, the New England transcendentalists. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's called the New Thought movement, out of which positive thinking grew. Mm -hmm. uh, the American pragmatic philosophy mm -hmm. developed by William James, who right. grew up in that era of American transcendentalism and and the uh, philosophy of. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, for yeah. for example. Well, William James was probably the pioneer American psychical researcher, and, and not only that, but uh, uh, philosopher of religion and the first great American psychologist. All of these things came together. They're very American, and uh, yet it seems in our era uh, they're kind of regarded as fringe, which uh, is yeah, unfortunate. Yeah, I'm hoping. I'm hoping because it has to do with living a life as a whole human being. Mm -hmm. And as someone, uh, my, my statement is to gain and disseminate knowledge and make the world a better place. Sometimes I'll say the universe, mm -hmm. but I don't know what the universe thinks of that. But I think, you know, there's so many lives that could be improved. And, so, and I do feel about the education, the children, need to be allowed to maintain that. Uh, I noticed with experiments with my son, which were not very formal, mm -hmm. but he was very good at finding me mm -hmm. for hide and seek up until he was about two or three. Then other people had telepathy that says I isn't real. Yeah. And it was harder for him to find me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> yes, there is, uh, a, a, you know, in my growing up, you know, that doesn't exist, you know, it, uh, it, uh, the psyche phenomena yeah. doesn't exist. Well, all children play hide and seek, you know, in every single culture, and it's like an ESP training game. I, it is, and I think it's very interesting how it goes because as you're indoctrinated, and I'm going to use a strong word here, into what I feel is educating only the idea of the in informational, not just intellect, but information. Is you need to learn to read and write and so forth, but and do arithmetic. But you have to educate the whole human, their emotions, their motivations, their creativity, and, intuition. and their desire and their intuition. Mm -hmm. And then you would have a very different society. Well, I guess there are forces at play to try and discourage people from doing that, and maybe there are evolutionary reasons for it, that uh, uh, some species, perhaps the human species, felt that w we could enhance our own survival if we can uh, do things to discourage others from using their psi abilities. Well, that's a huge, huge issue because to me, this goes beyond the U.S. It's worldwide. Mm -hmm. We need to come together as a human race and in compassion. I'm going to sound like a, a hippie. <laughs> I'm going to sound like a hippie. Yeah, compassionate. Here yeah, I'm a physicist selling compassion and love. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I see that not as irrational. I see it as rational. It makes sense because mm -hmm. the quality of life can be much enhanced. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, is it possible to have a utopia? And I lived with the Hopi people for a while, and it was just like everything was synchronistic. You didn't say, oh, I'm going to go to so-and-so's house at such and such a time. You just showed up, and someone had spaghetti and corn, and there was a feast, and it was just flow. It was like a timeless flow in which Psy was not other. They couldn't even understand when I talked about remote viewing because they just assumed that exists. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't different like mm -hmm. in, in our Western European yeah. American culture. And it just was uh, so harmonious. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important to point out that as a physicist, you have come to the conclusion uh, that physics and psi are not incompatible with each other. No, um, I, I, uh, when I first started talking, of course, what, what academics do is they talk about their experiments. So then I had people saying, but it's denied by the main body of physics. So I spent uh, 35 or 40 years showing the compatibility 
of non-locality psychic phenomena with the standard model of physics and it's built in there in terms of a complex geometry and also the Calusa Klein geometry. Mm -hmm. Now so we're talking about hyperspace. Ex that it would be called hyperspace. It's more than space time. It's mm -hmm. not just four four dimensions uh, with three being space and one of time. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like the minimum is a complex eight space, but there are other different models. Yeah. There are 10 and 11 dimensional models. Which are becoming pretty routine now. In, They're pretty in the, routine. In the most advanced theories of uh, string theory, membrane theory, and uh, many other movements in physics that are attempting to unify the various forces. Now, when I first talk about multidimensional geometries at Lawrence Berkeley in the late 1960s and early 70s, oh my gosh, did I get a reaction which was not positive mm -hmm. and not quite as bad as talking about psychic phenomena. But now it's just an integral part of modern physics. And I think that it's a vision uh, that not only makes sense from the physics point of view, but the psychological, the parapsychological, and fits with the philosophical understanding of the ex existence mm -hmm. that we live in. And I suppose one has to point out that at a spiritual level, the very notion that we're all interconnected with each other, uh, if everybody understood that, it might be a better world to live in. We might treat each other more like we would wish to be treated. Uh, I'll predict that that would be true. Mm -hmm. As a scientist. <laughs> As a scientist. Oh, may I, now, we have to do the experiment, of course. <laughs> now, we've got about uh, uh, seven or eight billion to get uh, people to get online with this experiment, so it's going to take a little bit of work. But no, I, I think it's very fundamental. I mean, when I travel all over the world, it always seems like, you know, I just feel in harmony with all the different people and their, uh, you know, their life, their desires, their wants, their needs, their families, their occupation, and it's just uh, all the same, you know, and mm -hmm. it's a unity of thought, and a, I think there's a fundamental unity of consciousness. Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, what a joy to be with you again after so many decades since we did our first remote viewing experiment together. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it immensely. And thank you for being with us.